Hey, what's up? Welcome to the feast. I am glad that you joined us today. Um, if you're new on this online space, it is good to have you here. Now, speaking of space, starting next Sunday, March 6, we will be returning on site for our feast at Bellevue Hotel's Grand Ballroom. And really, I've been looking forward to this. I hope to see you there in person, in the flesh, right? Our feast will begin at 3 p.m. with Holy Mass, of course, to be followed by, the, by inspiring music for worship and the preaching of God's word for you. Now, uh, more details have been, I think, posted on our different social media platforms, so you can check them out there. Um, however, if you can't come live, no worries, no problem. Um, we will continue to have our online live stream every Sunday because definitely, definitely, you are very much part of our Feast family and we, we would love to be together, whether it be online or on site, all right? Now, today, we are at the second to the last stop of our whole journey through the Gospel of Matthew. And really, what a journey it has been, I think, for the last two years. For the last two years, um, I believe um, our faith has been deepened, our hearts have been transformed, and our walk with Jesus has been strengthened as we continue to follow Him. Yes? Now, for this message, I want you to take, with, take your Bibles um, along with me, all right? Take your Bibles, whether it's physical or digital, and turn to Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 54. Again, that's Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 54. And to unpack this message first, because I'll come second, please welcome a very good friend of mine. He's one of our worship leaders uh, from Feast Worship. He serves as one of the leaders at Feast Bay Area Afternoon Session. Personally, I see so much godly gifting in him. Um, so much godly character and potential really in this person. I, for one, have been blessed by his growth and friendship through the years. And I believe today you will be blessed by him as well. So please welcome Brother Ayo Barcelona. Hi, everybody. I want to start my message for you today by, by saying thank you. Thank you so much to Brother Kuya Mike Vinas, your builder, for this shared opportunity to preach to you God's word today. I'm so excited because we're almost at the end of the road of our study of Matthew. You know, and, and man, what an exciting trip it has been, right? No? Mapapakanta ka ng What a journey it has been And the end is not inside da 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 O diba? Saktong-sakto, nakikinig natin yung song na yan sa mga graduation ceremonies. And bagay na bagay, because it, it's like we're graduating from this study. So, congratulations to you who journeyed with us since day one. Or if you joined in on, on later on, I'm sure that you were blessed with or by this message or study on Matthew or of Matthew. So, game. Game na tayo. For today... We are going to receive an amazing and powerful message I personally believe is very timely as well. Are you guys ready? So if you guys are ready, I want you to type in right now, I'm ready. I am ready to receive your word for us, God, today. G? All right. The big message that I want you guys to take home from this first part of today's talk is this. You ready? All right. God wants to love through you. God wants to love through you. Woo! Wala, wala na. Wala na finish na. <laughs> Dito pa lang, this one line, it says so many things already. There's so many things to unpack. It speaks to us in numerous, in various, in grand ways. But I want you to make it a lot more personal. Okay, can we do that? Now, again, God wants to love through you, but let's make it a lot more personal. I want you to put your hands over your chest right now. And together, let's say it. 
God wants to love through me. God wants to love through me. Whew. I'm getting the chills to be honest. No? Just the mere fact that God wants to channel his love through you and love others. Oh, hakilig. Um, but, you know, for today, we're, we're, we're ending the series by revisiting the death of Jesus. And can I, can I say a, a quick confession to you guys? No? Well, wala naman kayong choice. But uh, bear with me for a short while. You know, growing up as a kid, I, I didn't really enjoy or I didn't really like Holy Week. I mean, come on, as a kid, you weren't allowed, or I wasn't allowed to eat meat. I wasn't allowed to, to watch TV. I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to play Counter-Strike or Dota. I, I was supposed to be reserved and quiet and in prayer mode and reflection mode. <laughs> Sorry, Lord. And, and you know, we, we had to watch the Passion of the Christ over and over and over again and, and had to revisit that gruesome and graphic and violent way when Jesus suffered and died on the cross and they, they'd expect me to, to, to be guilty of my sins or cry over the death of Jesus. But to be honest, when I was a kid, I didn't really get to understand did he really have to die? Did Jesus really have to die on the cross? And, and if he did have to, why did he die for me? Why me? <laughs> you know, we're talking about Jesus Christ here. Why would he die for me? And uh, today, we're going to explore more of that. So as we revisit this story, as we read it together, I, I encourage you to read it with fresh eyes. You know, like first time ulit, tinan natin kung ano yung pwede pa nating makita sa kwentong to na alam na alam natin. Alright? So, if you have your Bibles with you, um, please turn to Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. I'm reading through my phone because uh, Brother Bo mentioned a few years ago that the young people read the Bible through their Bible apps on their phones. So yes, I am young. <laughs> All right, so Matthew 27, 27 to 31. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and, taunt and taunted, Hail! Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. You know, this of course was this, of course, occurred at the break of dawn on Good Friday. And, and this is the second time Jesus was mocked. First by the Jews and now by the Roman soldiers. Later, we'll, we'll read how Jesus is mocked the third time by, by passerby while he was hung on the cross. But, you know, re reading this passage again, or, or this first few uh, verses, it, it got me wondering... Could Matthew be asking this very disturbing question? Are you ready? You ready to be disturbed? Do we give God real worship or fake worship? I'll let that simmer in. Do we give God real worship or fake worship? worship. Grabe, no? In countless stories, Matthew was saying fake worship 
is when we're religious but not loving others. For example, the leaders observed the Sabbath but did not take care of the sick or didn't care at all for the sick. Or, or, or they managed the temple sacrifices but they stole from the poor who offered those sacrifices. This kind of religiosity was mocking God. It was all fake. And throughout Jesus' time here on earth 2,000 years ago, he reminded us all through his stories, through his actions, through his decisions, that real worship is loving others. I'll say that again. Through Jesus' actions, thoughts, decisions, everything that he did in his time here on earth, he proved to us all that real worship is loving others. Real worship is choosing love and forgiveness towards those who, who go against you, those who condemn you. Real worship is sharing a meal with sinners and tax collectors. Uh, today, real worship can look like you know, accepting and understanding those who don't share the same preferences as you. Real worship, real, real worship is, is choosing to understand why we go to church and actually live out what we learn from it. Real worship is choosing to wake up early in the morning so you can take care of your family, feed your dog, even if you want to sleep in. Real worship is all about loving others. That's what we learn from Jesus. I just want to sidetrack a little bit, you know, all this discussion about fake worship and real worship. Have, have you guys ever met someone that is highly religious? You know, someone who prays the rosary and, and memorizes all the prayers and hears mass on a daily basis and, and would, even ser would even serve a church every single Sunday. Do you know the type that I'm talking about? And don't get me wrong. These are all amazing and beautiful things. These are good things. And I actually admire people who, who get to do these things faithfully. But, but then these same religious people or, or this certain person happens to be the total opposite of who you thought he would be because of his religiosity when he's outside of church. You know, pag nasa office, he loves to scream at his workmates, nagmumura, na ang init ng ulo lagi, lahat hinahanapan ng mali. May kilala kayong ganyan? Do you know someone? Well, I'm praying that you don't. Kasi, you know, these kinds of people, mapapaano kayo, like, ha? Huh? Really? Parang, parang may mali. No? So again, hopefully you don't know anyone like this, but again, Going back, we have to remember that real worship is all about loving others. Again, don't get me wrong. Being highly religious is a very good thing. But if you choose that over loving others, or if you don't even love others at all, but you choose to be highly religious, there's, you're, you're a fake worshiper if you do that. Because real worship is loving others. You know, I just want to quickly honor my, my LG, you know, my closest friends who are my example, my examples of, of real worshipers. You know, these people that you see, yes, we try our best to be religious. You know, again, that's very important, but we always see to it that the goal and our priority is to love others. Always. So shout out to Isa, the girls, and the boys. <laughs> Thank you for showing us, showing me what the definition of a real worshiper is. And so if, if you know people in your life that are real worshipers, I want you to tag them right now. Just thank them. Thank them for choosing to love others first and putting that as their number one goal and priority. Tag them, like right now. So now, in connection to fake worship versus real worship, which we define as loving others, or which Jesus defined and modeled as loving others, 
we have to understand that when we are indifferent to the needy, we're crowning Jesus with thorns, hitting him with a stick, and spitting on him. When you choose to take advantage of anyone, even in the slightest way possible, you're crowning Jesus with thorns. When you allow someone to get hurt, when you had the chance to, to stop it, you're hitting Jesus with a stick. When you decide to, to just call someone illiterate or dumb online instead of educating him or her, you're, you're spitting on Jesus. Do, do you now understand why, why reading the Bible in context is, is very dangerous? It's, it's not comforting at all. Because the point here is this. If all the crucifixion story does is give us religious goosebumps, I hate it to break it to you, but we're not getting the message. Let's say that again. If all the crucifixion story does is give us religious goosebumps, then we're not getting the message. And so we ask ourselves, should I focus just on what happened in this story? Or should I look into why this story happened and why it continues to be told 2,000 years later in the first place? Matthew is telling us something deeper here. So let's move on to verse 32. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon. Sounds familiar. Who was from Cyrene. Yung Simon, yung familiar. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. I want you to think about it for a second here. The Simon, or another Simon, had to help Jesus carry his cross because the original Simon was missing. The, the Simon called Peter that boasted that he was ready to die for Jesus was missing in action. It was a different Simon who carried Jesus' cross. So perhaps Matthew is asking, what kind of Simon will you be? The loud one that makes big promises to God but in the end runs away? Or the one that didn't even want to go in the first place but end up actually carrying the cross? The first Simon makes promises. The second Simon shows up makes promises, shows up. The world today is in a mess because people do not show up. Fathers don't show up. Husbands, partners don't show up. Leaders don't show up. Friends, do you want to follow Jesus? You know, if you do, can you just type it in the comment section right now? I want to follow Jesus. Let's, let's make that declaration today. If you do want to follow Jesus, let's, let's put a digital footprint, footprint to that statement. Type it in the comment section now. I want to follow Jesus. And you want to know what the secret is to following Jesus? The secret is to show up. Show up. Show up for, for daily prayer. Show up for, for the weekly feast. You know, show up in your relationships, in your family, in your businesses. Show up in your workplace, regardless if it's from home or online. Show up. Mahirap yung puro salita lang. Wala namang gawa. Hashtag hugot. Show up. Show up. And, you know, I just want to honor you. Yes, you. Listening right now through your phone or through your iPad, through, your, through the television, with your family. I, I want to honor you. You know why? You know what you just did today? You chose to follow Jesus by showing up. 
you could have been watching All of Us Are Dead or something today because it's a Sunday. You could have chilled and relaxed or something, but you chose to show up. You know, up. Uh, Maybe you, you were just randomly tagged by a friend or a co-worker or, or, or baka naklik mo lang yung video kasi nakita mo si Erwan Yusef sa, thumb, sa thumbnail. Sorry, that's Kuya Mike Vinas who is more handsome. But what I'm trying to say is you decided to show up. Maybe the circumstances led you to show up here today, but I honor you. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're listening, that you're hearing this message, you decided to follow Jesus. By showing up. Amen. Amen. You know, I'll share with you one last story before we read the last part of, of the passage. And uh, this is a very personal story to me because this is the story of how God revealed to me the power of showing up. All right. So my story starts with this image. Now, this is my sister. Her name is Aya. She's 12 now. Very beautiful, smart, talented, sweet, kind, gentle. Siyempre naman, di ba? Kanina pa ba magmamana yan? Of course, sa kuya. <laughs> but in, in my story, in relation to this photo, the person that you're looking at or, or the face that you see on the right, is the face of God to me. It's the face of how beautiful God revealed to me the power of showing up. Because seven to eight years ago, I was lost. I was a fake worshiper. And, and I'm, not I'm not ashamed to say that. This is my story. I was one crazy fake worshiper. Yes, I would attend the feast weekly. Yes, I understood and I memorized the prayers. Yes, I would go to Mass. Yes, I participated in the sacraments. Yes, my body was there, but my mind and my heart weren't. I became an alcoholic, took substances, had addiction in gaming and pornography. And the biggest addiction that I had seven or eight years ago was that I was addicted to not showing up to myself, my family, my life as a student, as a partner, as a friend, and as a kuya, as a brother. I failed to show up. Or no, no, I... I chose not to show up. But then one day, I, I got home from school and I was sitting on the couch downstairs at home, here at home. And I saw the face of my sister. She was, she was so little then. Uh, now she's almost as tall as me. Pang beauty queen talaga si Aya. But, you know, again, eight years ago, she was so little, so pure, so genuine, so innocent. And she was sitting there on the couch watching Frozen and she had this genuine smile on her face and I, I at that moment it hit me. God spoke to me. Will I continue to not show up and watch Aya grow and see her older brother as a lost and broken individual? Will I allow Aya to grow up seeing, you know, she's gonna meet boys someday. She's gonna meet uh, young men, hopefully men, you know. Uh, she will. And that day, I knew that it wasn't right. If her standards of a guy would be modeled after me, in that moment, I made a decision to myself, to my sister, and to God that for Aya, of course, for my family and for myself, I chose and I continue to choose every day to show up. Show up. Friends, do you want to follow Jesus? 
Or do you want to love like Jesus? Show up. Show up. Because when you show up, you're allowing God to give you and you're allowing yourself to receive God's love and give it for, for others to others. Show up. Receive God's love and give it to others. Amen? Amen. You know, from here on, I'll, I'll read the end of the passage, then, then we'll get to listen to Brother Mike Venus now. And so, we continue to read. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now! You know, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the, the curtain in the, in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. The Roman officer and the soldiers, the other soldiers at the crucifixion, were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. So friends, I want you to say it again with me. God wants to love through you. God wants to love through me. And how do we prove that love? And what is the face of that love? It's showing up. Show up. My prayer for you today is that you make that big decision in your life right now. You know, regardless if it's not clear for you yet, regardless if you don't even know why you are where you are now in this season of your life, decide to show up. Because friends, He never fails to show up in your life. God bless you. Thank you, Ayo, for encouraging us and challenging us with the truth of God's Word. Now, to go further, um, for us to understand and appreciate more the significance of Jesus' death on the cross, um, let's do some theology, all right? Let's do some theology, shall we? Because my heart is burning in the inside. I think, I believe we must do this. We ought to do this. Because what is at stake is our image of God. You see, you become who you worship. In other words, how you see God impacts who you become and how you live your life. I mean, have you noticed? There are some who, who've been religious for years, yet they're the most judgmental, right? They look down on others. They condemn others. They actually hate a lot of people in God's name. And many times the root cause is their picture of God. It's distorted. And so when you have a distorted image of God, you have a distorted life, or at least you're living a distorted life. And this reminds me, this reminds me of uh, our neighbor a long time ago. I came to Mass one early morning nearby our house. Then after Mass, I was walking home. As I saw, as I saw a woman who I also saw come from Mass that same morning. And I think she usually goes to Mass uh, regularly because I see her as well from time to time. So she was walking a couple of meters ahead of me, a couple paces ahead of me. And um, after walking for a few minutes, she turned right and entered into her house. Uh, about two minutes uh, after, I eventually, because I was behind her, came passing by her house. And when I passed her house, I heard shouting, I heard cursing. I won't even mention here the kind of words that I heard, right? But the scene I could make up in my head was that the owner of the house, possibly the woman I saw who just came from Mass, 
was giving a scolding, was, was berating her household staff. It was crazy. I was somehow taken aback. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps, and this is just my guess, perhaps because her behavior is based out of a picture of God or a wrathful picture of God. So I think we need to correct the distortions of how we see God, right? And so another reason, apart from that, why I'm doing theology today is because I believe you can handle this. See, the feast is a thinking community. Agree? Right? So today, hopefully, through this message, we will be able to answer these hard questions. Questions like, how did Jesus' death save us from our sins? And, and the question, can God just forgive me without Jesus dying on the cross? And lastly, do we really follow a God who killed his own son? So by clarifying these, I believe we'll be able to somehow see a better image, a better picture of who God really is, right? Now that said, let me share with you four models of understanding the crucifixion, okay? Because if you look at our 2,000 year history, you'll see more models in fact. Or in theology, it's called actually atonement theories. And these models or theories try to explain why Jesus had to die. All right? There are a lot of it, but at least for the interest of this message, we'll stick with the four major ones. Okay? So, you see, um, these four models may differ um, amongst itself, but they all agree on one thing. All right? They have one commonality, and it is this. That the crucifixion is God's most eloquent expression of his love for us. I'll say that again. The crucifixion is God's most eloquent expression of his love for us. I mean, if you ask God, how much do you love me? He'll show you. He'll show you by stretching out his arms, just like he did in the cross, and tell you, this much this much. The question is, why did he have to die? So, each of these models somehow try to answer this question and give us the significance of Jesus' crucifixion, right? So the first model, we'll call this escape, or more, this is more popularly known in theology as the ransom theory, right? The guy behind this theory, the guy who wrote more about this, was a guy named Origen. He was alive at around 184 to about 253 AD, and he was a brilliant Bible scholar and a church father. And so with just a few words, let me try to somehow explain to you um, his model, the ransom theory, all right? And it is this. Because we sinned against God, we sold ourselves to the devil. So the devil owned us. He had the certificate of ownership of our soul. And the devil asked God, if you want your people back, buy them back by your death. And God bought us back with the death of Jesus on the cross. And so for thousands of years, this was the predominant uh, theory. This was the predominant understanding of Jesus' crucifixion and its significance. Um, and this is what we believed. Until, until another one came along, all right? And this is the second model. Let's call it exchange. In fact, there are two versions of it that I'll explain just in a bit. But this model um, was originated by Anselm of Canterbury. He came later um, after Origen, I think at around 1033 to 1109 AD, okay? And he came along saying, and of course I'm paraphrasing this, this was what his model was about. He says, he says to Origen, or to those who believed in the ransom theory, you guys are wrong, right? The devil could not have owned us. You're giving, too, you're giving him too much credit, right? He's a defeated foe. So no, the payment made wasn't to the devil. The payment was to God the Father, all right? And as I mentioned, there are two versions of this exchange model, all right? The first one is this. It's called the satisfaction theory. Here's the gist, okay? When we sin, we don't honor God. We dishonor Him. So, 
we actually owe God honor. And Jesus honored God so much by his obedience on the cross that his surplus paid for our deficit. All right? I hope you're, 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 you're following, you're tracking along. So what's the difference? What's the difference now? Let me just check this. All right. What's the difference between the ransom or escape model and the exchange model? Well, in the ransom model, the death of Jesus was payment to the devil. In the exchange model, the death of Jesus was payment to the Father. And this, if we think about it, is the predominant model used in the Catholic Church today. The satisfaction theory is, I think, the predominantly used um, understanding of Jesus' crucifixion in the Catholic Church today. It's so simple and powerful. But 500 years later, after this model was introduced by Anselm of Canterbury, the model took a more punitive, or we, we could call it a harsher orientation. Um, and this next model, or a variation of this model, is, one of, is, I think, the predominant model used in most Protestant, evangelical, and born-again churches today. Right? And so this is the second version. It's called the penal sub penal substitution theory, right? The penal substitution theory. And this was authored or originated by John Calvin. This was around, I think, 1509 and between 1509 to 1564, okay? And he was one of the pioneers of Protestantism and was the first guy who wrote extensively on this theory or on this model. So to this day, I think it's, it's still being used. It's still written in those little pamphlets called the Four spiritual laws. So this is how it goes. All right? This is how this theory um, is understood. Right? That first of all, all men have sinned. We see this in Romans 3.23, right? All men have sinned and the payment of sin, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, all right? And according to this theory, all sin, listen, okay? all sin is a sin against God, right? Uh, somehow, I'll give you an example of this, all right? Let's say if I slap my neighbor, I'll probably get a slap back. Right? But if I say I walk up to, let's say, the chief of police and ask, are you the chief of police? And when he says yes, I slap him in the face, I'll, I'll bet I'll get more than a slap. I'll probably get a beating from him and from his men, right? Because why? His rank is higher. Now, if I go to the President of the United States, walk into the White House and say, Mr. President, good morning, and then give him a slap, what do you think will happen to me? I'll probably get into jail, maybe stay there for a year, or even be sentenced for more, for longer. So why different punishments, right? Because think about it, I violated a higher rank or position. And according to this model, every sin is a slap against God. And because he's an eternal being, the punishment is eternal death. And so according to this model, God must punish sin. His justice requires it. So he can't forgive us just with a snap of a finger. I mean, someone has to pay. And that someone has to be another eternal being to pay an eternal sin. And that eternal being, if you connect the dots with me, that eternal being is Jesus. So he dies in my place, in your place, in our place, so that we don't have to die. So that's how this theory works. But to tell you honestly, I am a bit bothered by this penal substitution theory. Because I'm thinking, does God's justice really demand the death of his son? Right? Does God's justice really demand the death of his son, Jesus? I mean, some preachers will even say God's wrath has to be satisfied. Now, just listening to that, hearing that, reminds me too much of Moloch, the, the pagan god of the Canaanites. It was an, it was an idol made of iron it's barely a fiery oven, its arms flaming red, stretched out, ready to receive child sacrifices. 
Okay? And worshippers, and this happened in the ancient times, worshippers throw their babies to this idol, burning them to death. I mean, that was their sacrifice. And the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, condemned the horrors of this kind of idolatry. So thank God. Thank God for Pope Benedict himself, the man who for 24 years was the Vatican's doctrinal gatekeeper. He actually questioned this penal substitution model. And he did so through his book, Introduction to Christianity. And he wrote this. He said, I'll read from here. It is an unworthy concept of God to imagine a God who demands the slaughter of his son to pacify his wrath. Such, or God must not be thought of in this way. Such a concept of God has nothing to do with the idea of God to be found in the New Testament. So the penal substitution model, if you look at it closely, somehow maybe gets its inspiration from the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament, of ancient times, where an animal had to die for God to forgive. But was this really what the Bible was saying? Because in the Old Testament itself, the psalmist said this in Psalm 51 verse 16. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in, birth, in burnt offerings. Interesting, right? So, can God forgive us of our sins without Jesus dying on the cross? Right? Think about it. Can God forgive us for our sins without Jesus dying on the cross? Well, again, let's look at Jesus. When Jesus, conf when Jesus was confronted with the adulterous woman, he forgave her on the spot. No substitution required. Same thing with the Samaritan woman, the paralyzed man, and Zacchaeus. Jesus even declared salvation has come to this household. Remember? And in the story of the prodigal son, which is a perfect example, really, did, did the father ask for a substitute before he forgave and welcomed back his son? None. In fact, Jesus even asked us to forgive how many times? 70 times 7, which means as long as it takes, right? right? Um, and so no punishment or substitution is required because really he doesn't require any. Therefore, right? I hope you're following along. It begs the question, why did Jesus die? Or, or, or why did Jesus have to die, right? And we'll answer that in a bit. But let me just share with you first, right? Let me share this with you first. And this is my most important point, right? All three models thus far that I've mentioned, including the fourth one that I will mention later, all three models are languages of love. Remember what we said earlier? That the crucifixion is God's most eloquent expression of his love for us. So all models, all theories are really just human attempts to capture the uncapturable, to comprehend the incomprehensible. You see, the death of Jesus on the cross is such a God event that our limited minds cannot fully and completely grasp it. We can only understand probably parts of it. In other words, all three models, all models for that matter, are trying to express in feeble, awkward, human language the depth, height, and weight of God's love. In fact, you can look at it this way. These models, these, these theories, are love languages. And if they're love languages, we must not take them too literally. Right? I'd say, for example, if I tell my wife, I'll give you the moon, the sun, and the stars. No me cantang ganon. Anyway, that doesn't mean that I'll become an astronaut, ride a rocket, fly it to space, and with the help of Elon Musk, gift wrap the moon and the sun and the stars and give that to her, right? I, you don't want to take that literally. I am not meaning that literally as well. See, in theology, the problem comes when legalists try to explain poetry. So all these all these previous models, 
are really valid images of the death of Jesus, even the penal substitution. And so we can still pray with passion, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And, and you can say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins, um, provided, provided that one does not take them all too literally, that one does not take even the penal substitution model too literally, right? By the way, there's one more model, right? There's one more, there's a fourth one. And I believe it's what we need to hear in our modern times. But really, it's not actually new. In fact, this model was probably the earliest understanding of the death of Jesus. The Christians, I think in the first and second centuries, saw the death of Jesus in this very simple yet profound way, right? And so the third model, let's call it, um, or let's name it calling, um, based um, on the moral influence theory. And we're naming it calling because here, the cross and how we understand it, how we see it, the cross is a call of discipleship. Many Christians in the first 300 years really didn't see the crucifixion of Jesus as penal substitution. They saw the crucifixion as a call to discipleship, to live their life in the exact same way that Jesus lived and died. And that is to also lay down their life for God and for others. And in this model or theory, when you look at the cross, okay, God says two things. First, he says, I love you. I'm willing to die for you. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? Scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In other words, God, in his love for us, in his love for humanity, he sends his son on a mission to do what? To build his kingdom here on earth, to establish his reign, his kingship of love. So by living under his rule of love, upholding kingdom values, living out kingdom culture, that's how we are saved from sin. Unfortunately, when, when Jesus was building that kingdom of love, some people didn't like it. They didn't like this way of love. They didn't like this way of love. It even angered uh, the religious and political leaders of his day because their hypocrisy and, the corrupt, and their corruption were exposed. Thus, Jesus right, faced opposition and persecution to the point of crucifixion on the cross. But in spite of all this, Jesus, in obedience to the Father, remained faithful to his mission, even if, even if he knew that it would cost him his life. I mean, he loved to the point of death. And that is why when you look at the cross, it says, Jesus says, I love you and I'm willing to die for you. That's the first thing that the cross says. The second thing that the cross says is, imitate me, follow me. You wanna live a life of love? You die like me, Jesus says. You die like Jesus so that others may live. See, the cross and the broken bread say the same thing, say the same message. Do this in memory of me. And this is not only telling us to celebrate Mass, but for each and every one of us to actually break oneself like bread and feed the hungry. Feed the hungry. Now, this is not just all good to know. Right? We ought to know now how this all applies in our daily life. So how does it, right? And here's how. Through the cross, Jesus is calling us to daily martyrdom. A friend of mine who's been married for, for 20 year, 23 years now says this. He says, I now have my definition of a great husband. Right? He says, a great husband is someone who apologizes to his wife when he does something wrong and apologizes to his wife when she does something wrong. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm joking, but just a little bit. Because if, really, if you think about it, if you hurt your wife, husbands, listen, if you hurt your wife, you apologize, period. 
right? You don't argue with her emotions. See, a great husband is a dead husband. Right? He dies each day to his own needs, to his own preferences, for the sake of his beloved, for the sake of his wife. Yes? And parenting is the same. Parenting is the same. Now that Kyler is growing, there are times, really, at the end of the day, when I'm just so much tired from work. And all I want to do is to crash in my bed. But what happens? He then comes to me, smiling and all cute, signaling that he wants to play with me. So what do I do? I sit down on the floor and play with him with his toys. And this, of course, comes with matching animated acting, right? Um, which makes it more tiring. Or, or recently, we would play uh, with Bea, my wife, hide and seek with him, which is probably the last thing you want to do at the end of the day. But Vey and I do it anyway. We do it anyway by God's grace. Because again, love is dying to oneself so that others may live. Amen. Amen. Same thing for those of you singles. The other day, I, I have a friend who was so busy working on an upcoming event. When one of his friends messages him late that night, because he was, I think, his friend was distraught due to a family crisis. So what did my friend do? He dropped everything. He dropped everything. He stayed up with his friend and just consoled him amidst all the pain. Right? Because again, Jesus, through his example, calls us to be martyrs. And with this, with this, may I invite you to be an opportunity, may I invite you to an opportunity to die once again to oneself. And one way that you can do that is by giving generously to our feast. See, because through your giving, you are making a selfless sacrifice to help sustain this ministry moving forward. And really for that, we honor you and we thank you for your valued support. Here are the different easy ways that you can give online. Thank you very much. Now, speaking of martyrdom, as I close, let me share with you how here at the feast, we are surrounded by such wonderful martyrs. Let me introduce you to one of them. See, during the Omicron surge, early January, drugstores ran out of paracetamol, right? Remember that? Paracetamol and other basic drugs. Now my good friend and co-feast builder, Monching Bueno, was able to get a stash from a pharma company. So while wearing two face masks, plus a helmet with a big bottle of alcohol in his pocket, he rode around the city on his motorbike giving medicines away for free to sick feasters. Joy Cabrillas his, is now the head, of, head nurse of Anawim, our home for the abandoned elderly. And each week, she and her husband, Obed, would drive through the muddy roads to Anawim right, in Rizal to, to serve the lolos and the lolas there. And when we were trying to give, him her, give her a salary, she said, no need. Serving them is my blessing. Another example of this is Jason, Jason Vergara. He's our missionary who just loves going to unreachable places in the provinces. And to date, he has already built, get this, get this, he has already built 70 feast lights among the poor, especially poor children. In fact, this year, this 2022, he's aiming to build 16 more. Amazing. Dr. Didoy Lobaton, in the last two years, has been the doctor of many when they had COVID, including myself. And he's been caring for hundreds of people who have had or continue to have COVID. And I don't really know how this guy does it, okay? But I'm sure it has really taken a lot of dying to himself. His wife, in fact, has to die to herself as well because she has to support her husband to do, to do such dangerous work for love. Okay? Feast builder and friend, Brother John Escoto, um, expanded our prison ministry. And we now have hundreds of feast lights all over Luzon and through them, I think 4,000, about 4,500 plus prisoners receive God's word, receive God's love through what they're doing in these prisons. John and his team of feast planters um, really just obeyed literally when Jesus said, visit the prisoners. So believe me, 
there are thousands of beautiful martyrs in the feast. And I know you're one of them. I know you're one of them. You've given so much to serve others. Why? Because we die, we die especially for those who are suffering. My friend, if all the crucifixion gives us our religious goosebumps or, or, or tears of guilt, then we're missing the point. Because the crucifixion must push us to lay down our life for others. The crucifixion must push us to lay down our lives for others. And here's what Pope Francis said. And I'll, I'll end with this, reading it here. He says, The Christian cross is not something to hang in the house or an ornament to wear, but a call to love. So say this with me, my friend. God wants to love through me. Say that again. God wants to love through me.